confession together in your word and then for our time together which follows and we pray that God the Holy Spirit would continue to make your word clear to us today we ask this in Jesus name amen all right I I feel more at ease now because I'm going to be able to get through what I wanted to get through which is pretty much just what E.W. Bullinger has to say about figures of speech regarding the serpent. And then we're going to see an example of something. Uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to overlap just a little bit here from what I read uh, to give us some more context for the rest of what E.W. Bullinger had to say in Appendix 19 of his uh companion Bible. Uh, so here we go. When Satan is spoken of as a serpent, it is the figure hypocas uh, hypocatastasis, see Appendix 6, or implication. It no more means snake than it does when Dan is called, uh, so-called in Genesis 49.17, 49, or an animal when Nero is called lion, a lion in 2 Timothy 4, verse 17, or when Herod is called a fox, Luke 13, verse 32, or when Judah is called a lion's whelp. It is the same figure when doctrine is called leaven, Matthew 16, verse 6. It shows that something much more real and truer to truth is impressed and is intended to be a figure of something much more real than the letter of the word. Other figures of speech are used in verses 14 and 15, but only for the same purpose of emphasizing the truth and the reality of what is said. When it is said in verse 15, thou shalt bruise his heel, it cannot mean his literal heel of flesh and blood, but suffering more temporary in character. When it is said, verse 15, he shall crush thy head, it means something more than a skull of bone and brain and hair. It means that all Satan's plans and plots, policy and purposes, Will, be will one day be finally crushed and ended, never more to mar or to hinder the purposes of God. This will be effected when Satan shall be bruised under our feet, Romans 16, verse 20, which says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, the grace of God and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This, again, will not be our literal feet, but something much more real. The bruising of Christ's heel is the most eloquent and impressive way of foretelling the most solemn events. And to point out that the effort made by Satan to evade his doom then threatened would become the very means of assuring its accomplishment. For it was through the death of Christ that he who had the power over, uh, the power of death would be destroyed and all Satan's power and policy brought to an end and his works destroyed. Hebrews 2.14 First John 3, 8, Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3 and 10. What literal words could portray these literal facts so wonderfully as these expressive figures of speech? It is the same with other figures of speech used in verse 14. On thy belly thou shalt go. This figure means infinitely more than the literal belly of flesh and blood, just as the words heel and head do in verse 15. It paints for the eyes of our mind the picture of Satan's ultimate humiliation. 
for prostration was ever the most eloquent sign of subjection. When it is said, our belly cleaveth unto the ground, Psalm 44, verse 25, it denotes, denotes such a prolonged prostration and such a depth of submission as could never be conveyed or expressed in literal words. So with the other prophecy, dust shall thou eat. This is not true to the letter or to fact, but it is all the more true to truth. It tells of constant, continuous disappointment, failure, and mortification as when deceitful ways are spoken of as feeding on deceitful food, which is sweet to man, but afterwards his mouth shall be filled with gravel. Proverbs 20, verse 17. This does not mean literal gravel, but something far more disagreeable. It means disappointment so great that it would be gladly exchanged for the literal gravel. So when Christians are rebuked for biting and devouring one another, Galatians 3, verses 14 and 15, something more heartbreaking is meant than the literal words used in the figure. When his enemies shall lick the dust, Psalm 72, verse 9, they will not do it on their knees with their literal tongues, but they will be prostrated and so utterly defeated that no words could literally depict their overthrow and subjugation. If a serpent was afterward called a nakash, it was because it was more shining than any other creature, and if it became known as wise, it was not because of its own innate positive knowledge, but of its own wisdom and hiding away from all observation and because of its association with one of the names of Satan, the old serpent who beguiled Eve, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3 and 14. It is wonderful how a snake could ever suppose, could ever be supposed to speak without the organs of speech, or that Satan should be uh, supposed to be able to accomplish so great a miracle. Now, there, I'll take a break. I disagree with Bollinger a bit on that. I don't know if that's so, uh, because Satan is uh, allowed by the sovereignty of God to do many things. Now, in the case of Balaam's ass, in Numbers, uh, E.W. Bullinger pointed out a difference, and that is that uh, it was God's doing uh, that the ass spoke. But in any case, I don't know if that particular thing is, is true, that uh, Satan would not be able to accomplish such a miracle as to speak through... Uh, some kind of uh, reptile or any other form of, of animal. But uh, as far as what he has to say on figures of speech, I think it's, it's right on the money. All right, back to Bullinger. It only shows that the power of tradition, which has from the infancy of each one of us put before our eyes and written on our minds the picture of a snake, and an apple, the former being based on wrong interpretation and the latter being a pure invention about which there is not one word said in Holy Scripture. You've seen it since you were a kid, presented in an apple. You see it enough? It's, it's like the old saying, you repeat it enough times, uh, you think it's true. Well, you see the apple enough times in artwork and, and in reference, and uh, you think that's the way it was. 
All right, back to Bullinger. Never was Satan's wisdom so craftily used as when he secured universal acceptance of this traditional belief, for it has succeeded in fixing the attention of mankind on the letter and the means, and thus blinding the eyes to the solemn fact that the fall of man had to do solely with the word of God and is centered in the sin of believing Satan's lie instead of Jehovah's truth. The temptation of the first man, Adam, began with a question, hath God said? The temptation of the second man, the Lord from heaven, began with the similar question, if thou be the Son of God. We'll get into that in Matthew chapter 4. When the voice of the Father had scarcely died away, which said, this is my beloved Son all turned on the truth of what Jehovah had said. The word, or as we uh, say today, uh, Yahweh, the word of God being questioned led Eve in her reply, number one, to admit the word freely, verse 3, 2, compare with 2, verse 16, and then 2, to add the words, neither shalt thou touch it, 3.3 3, compare to 17, and finally 3, to alter a certainty into a contingency by changing thou shalt surely die, 2.17, into lest ye die, verses 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 3 little departure from Bullinger. That's a lot going on with a, a few uh, a few words from Eve, isn't it? All right. Bullinger. It is not without significance that the first ministerial words of the second man were, it is written three times repeated. That's Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4. And that his last ministerial words contained a similar threefold reference to the written word of God, John 17, verse 8, verse 14, verse 17. The former temptation succeeded because the word of God was three times misrepresented. The latter temptation was successfully defeated because the same word was faithfully repeated. The history of Genesis 3 is intended to teach us the fact that Satan's sphere of activities is in the religious sphere, sphere and not the spheres of crime and immorality, that his battlefield is not the sins arising from human depravity, but the unbelief of the human heart. We are not to look for Satan's activities today in the newspaper press or the police courts, but in the pulpit and in professors' chairs. Whenever the word of God is called in question, there will be, uh, there we see the trail of that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. This is why anything against the true interests of the word of God as being such finds a ready admission into the newspapers of the world and is treated as general literature. That is why anything in favor of its inspiration and divine origin and its spiritual truth is rigid, rigidly excluded as being controversial. This is why Satan is quite content that the letter of Scripture should be accepted in Genesis chapter 3 as he himself accepted the letter of Psalm 91, Psalm 91 verse 11. And we're going to go there momentarily. 
because I'm wrapping up what E.W. Bullinger had to say. But let me say that again, since we're going to be going there. This is why Satan is quite content that the letter of Scripture should be accepted in Genesis chapter 3, as he himself accepted the letter of Psalm 91, verse 11. He himself could say, it is written, Matthew 4, verse 6, so long as the letter of what is written could be put instead of the truth that is conveyed by it. And so long as it is misquoted or misapplied, this is his object of perpetuating the traditions of the snake and the apple because it ministers to the acceptance of his lie, the hiding of God's truth, the support of tradition, the jeers of the infidel, and the opposition of critics, and the stumbling of the weak in faith. All right, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Two places real quickly, and then we will partake of the Lord's Supper. Matthew chapter 4, and this is the second uh, phase in the testing of the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll be paying uh, some attention in detail to this passage uh, in a future session. I'm going to take it from verse 5. Then the devil took him into the holy city. This is, of course, referring to Jesus taking the devil into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And that's from Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. Now you can turn quickly to Psalm chapter 91, where we will see Psalm 91, verse 11, to which E.W. Bullinger referred to as Satan using the letter and not uh, what the truth actually is. In Matthew, or in uh, Psalm chapter 91, this is, this is what uh, Satan was quoting to Jesus from the Word, but he omitted one clause in it. Verses 11 and 12 of Psalm 91, For he will give his angels charge concerning you, and this is the clause that, that Satan avoided, to guard you in all your ways, which means uh, literally he will protect you the whole way. And that is during the fulfillment of the spiritual life. In other words, it's not just to, it's not just to, uh, to fall off a uh, high elevation and ex expect that angels are going to come to the rescue. That is protection as one is fulfilling the plan of God. Verse 12, they will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. Of course, the Lord Jesus answered, you shall not, uh, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. But see, this is where, this is a place where Satan quoted 
the letter, but he skipped a spot, and sometimes in my teaching I skip a spot because we're going over passages very quickly, so I, I say, you know, now go down to the bottom of the chapter or whatever, uh, but he skipped apart for a very important purpose. That was so he could get across the, the some truth, or rather, uh, some well, I will say truth, some truth of the letter, but not truth in the sense of actual truth. So he omitted part of it, fired it at the Lord Jesus Christ to try and lure Christ into stepping outside the plan of God. All right, we'll close this with prayer and uh, begin our time together in the Lord's Supper. Father, thank you for your enlightenment through not so much me today, but another servant who has passed uh, quite a long time ago, but is still very much alive in the sense of his teaching, E.W. Bullinger. Father, we thank you for the insight that you've given us. We thank you in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.